Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Bartosz Zatok. I'm from Samsung Mobile Security Team. And today I'd like to tell you about our tool for memory serialization of the Linux kernel variables, which we called Kflat. So a few words about myself. I spent more than 15 years in various jobs in mobile product development. And in recent years, I've worked with security engineers uh, to perform the verification of the Linux kernel code for mobile devices. And <clears throat> today with me is uh, Pavel, one of the security engineers who actually wrote the Kflat tool with me. And a few words why we did that. So in our everyday work, our main job is to find, analyze, and debug software problems in the Linux kernel. And having known what's going on inside the system can be very helpful uh, for this analysis. And memory dumps comes handy at that task, but the problem is that the existing tools usually provide a very large dumps, uh, most likely the entire VM, and uh, you cannot easily re relate the content of the dump uh, with the corresponding source code structure. So this is what we needed for one of our tools. So that's why we developed it, and now we want to present it to you. So uh, how this talk will look like, so Pavel will start, and we'll tell you uh, what is Kflat, how it works, how to use it, and we'll give you some uh, interesting implementation details, and I will take over in the second part to uh, show you how Kflat could be used uh, to actually uh, uh, help fighting software problems in the Linux kernel. So I hope you will enjoy this presentation, and Pavel, let's get started. Thank you, Bertosz. So, Kflat, short for kernel flattening, is our open source tool for... Okay, sure. Uh, thanks. So it's our open source tool for serializing Linux kernel variables or function parameters and restoring them in any application, especially in C user space applications. So what Kflat does, it hooks into some target kernel function, obtains the reference to interesting for us variable, copies its content, and follow all the pointers in this dumped area that it could find. It sounds a bit simple, just a few mem copies and we're done. But there's a bit more to it since most of the kernel structures are huge. For instance, very commonly used structure TaskStruct has more than 3,000 direct dependencies. And by direct, I mean anything except void pointers, list heads, container ops, etc. So basically, if you would like to copy TaskStruct into new C project, we need to copy 3,000 other structures as well for code just to compile. So that's the scale we're dealing here with. Also, there are these uh, in specific kernel uh, constructions like list head, container of, that have to be handled accordingly. But once we deal with all these aspects, we end up with easy to use and portable memory dump. Such memory dump can be then loaded or mapped into a new application, into new address, into new virtual address space, and used like any other C memory. What we can use it for? We can use it for fuzzing initialization, for instance we can dump some memory from normally running system and use it as an initial corpus for fuzzer. We can use it for debugging. We can dump some internal kernel structures and then view them in user space, just like with KGDB, except that we don't have to recompile the whole kernel with config KGDB or use any additional hardware. Finally, we can use it for info or logs, stats, gathering. We can extract new metrics from the kernel by accessing its internal structures and uh, viewing them in user space. So how Kflat works? We call this process of serialization flattening because what Kflat does, it flattens some huge memory into a single continuous blob. Let's take a look at this simple example. On the left, we have uh, two structures, struct A with a pointer to struct B, and struct B with pointer to some string and pointer back to struct A. On the right, we have uh, an example representation of these of this two structures in the memory. Well, when Kflat starts its journey, in this example from structure A, it collects all the memory regions it could find by following the pointers. Then it sorts them in ascending orders and finally flattens them into a single continuous blob. Then it replaces all the pointers in this blob with offsets. And that way we end up with small and portable, easy to move and save, memory representation. When we would like to restore this memory in user space, all we do is we load this into new address space at some address X, and we fix all the pointers, all the offsets that are stored in this image with pointers in this new address space. Finally, we obtain a reference to our initial structure, so we have some entry point to this dumped memory. 
In such way, we end up uh, with the same memory in new application that can be used like any other C memory. But how Kflat knows where the pointers are in the structures? This is a quite tricky task, since in C we have no run type, type information, like in C++ or Golang, or other higher level languages. Also in C, pointers are a bit imprecise. We can have a pointer to void that basically can point to anything. We can have a pointer to integer that can point to a single integer on a, or an array of integers. Basically in C, pointers are just numbers that can point to anything and can be anywhere in the structure. So in Kflat, we use recipes, so-called Kflat recipes. They are the representation of Kflat structures uh, sorry, they are the representation of structures used by Kflat to precisely dump the target memory, to know where all the pointers are. Moving back to our previous example, for these two structures, the Kflat recipe looks like that. We have a structure A, we fill PB that has a pointer to structure, that is the pointer to structure B. We have a structure B that, is, that has a pointer to string in field S, and also a pointer to structure A in field PA. That way, we can, Kflat can precisely dump the memory and preserve all its layout. Let's take a look at a bit more complicated example, being an interval tree. Let's imagine we create in kernel interval tree and push into it all the virtual memory regions that are allocated in the kernel. Under the hood, such interval tree would be implemented using red black trees, just like just it could be seen on the left and right side of the slide, and by using a few lines of code, Kflat can dump this memory like without any problem. For the interval tree having uh, 600,000 intervals, the produced image have something around 32 megabytes, so, so it's quite portable, and the flattening process takes just a few milliseconds, so it's almost instantaneous. Now, how the Kflat works under the hood? From the very beginning, our goal was to use Kflat on embedded systems, like smartphones, smartwatches, Android devices, or IoT devices. And that's why we implemented Kflat as loadable kernel module. That way, we don't need to rebuild the whole kernel image every time we want to change something. We can simply build Kflat, push it onto the target device, and load into the kernel. Also, Kflat recipes that describes all these structures layouts are built as kernel modules as well, so we can hot plug them into the running system. Once we loaded Kflat into our system, we can start dumping memory. We first arm, K, arm Kflat on our target structure and target function and invoke this function somehow from the user space. For instance, by calling syscall or sending some netting packet or maybe performing hardware interaction. Using Kprop subsystems, Kflat hooks into the function and interprets, intercepts its call. Then, it invokes its flattening engine. At, the, at this point, Kflat follows the provided recipes and dumps the memory from the context of this function. So we have an access to stack variables, globals, heap. Basically, we see kernel just like this function would see. Finally, optionally, if user asks us to do so, we skip function execution to, uh, to avoid causing any side effects in the running systems. Of course, during this memory dump process, some exceptional situations may arise, with invalid pointers being the most common one. Whenever Kflat is dumping structure and following its pointers, it can encounter null pointers, user space pointers, in case on kernel, some input-output memory, and possibly wild pointers, because, for instance, some field in the structure is unused or uninitialized. And Kflat has to somehow detect all these types of the pointers and avoid causing kernel fault at any cost. We do this by kernel page table working. We, for each pointer the Kflat encounters, we translate it from the virtual address space into physical address space using page maps, just like normally CPU does, and then check whether the physical address is pointing into the RAM memory. Finally, we check whether this uh, RAM memory is readable to avoid to dump only the memory that is holding some data, not some code assembly that, cannot, that isn't portable in any way. That approach 
in contrary to relying to page fault handlers, allows us to detect whether the target pointers point to RAM, to avoid the dumping memory that is, for instance, mapped input out of memory, to which accesses could alter system state or even cause system crash. Next, Kflat has to somehow handle data races. Many kernel structures are used concurrently and are synchronized by using some synchronization primitives. For instance, mutexes, semaphore, spin locks. Kflat obviously cannot lock all of them since it would cause global system deadlock. So what we do, if we need it, is a bit straightforward and brutal, but we use stop machine to basically freeze all other tasks in the system. With that, we can create some memory snapshot from some moment of the kernel. If user needs to access the structure heavily used and wants to ensure that the memory is complete, he can, he can also specify the mutexes to be locked. Next, we have to handle somehow unknown array sizes. In kernel, quite often you can see zero size arrays or pointers to some integers or some structures that are of unknown size. It is not always obvious how, what is the size of these objects based solely on the static analysis of the code. So in Kflat, we also support extraction of allocation metadata from slab allocator. In cases when we are unsure of the target array size, we ask slab allocator to provide us with the necessary information about allocation size and to dump the whole array of the objects, even if we, cannot, even if we don't know at the compile time what its size is. Finally, very common pattern in the kernel are function pointers uh, embedded in the structures. For instance, structure file operations, very, of, very commonly used in the kernel, that is storing some function pointers to a handler. In Kflat, we cannot obviously dump the targeted memory pointed by, this point, pointed by this pointer, since this is the assembly code that cannot be used on the other machine in new virtual address space. So, Kflat, using CalSims, converts this function pointer into function name and saves it in our flattened image. Then, during the restoration, we expect the user to provide us a map that will, call, that will convert these function names into some functionally equivalent functions in the new system, in new address space. It can be some working function or it can be some simple stop if this function, its equivalent is unavailable in new application. That way we can prevail function pointers in new address space and make them work just like they would in the kernel. So, as we can see, Kflat is a bit tricky and somehow complicated. So what about some other approaches? Well, first of all, as Bartosz mentioned in the introduction, we can try using virtual machine snapshots. Basically run some kernel in the virtual machine and dump the whole machine. This approach has a few disadvantages. First of all, it's not always easy to run target kernel or drivers in VM, especially if they are intended to be used on some specific pro proprietary SOC. Also, the whole snapshot of the virtual machine is time consuming and resource consuming. We will end up with, for instance, eight gigabytes of memory. Also, this memory will be uh, a whole RAM memory dump, so it's not easy to deduce where some structure starts or ends. What are, for instance, if you, will, if you are interested in a very particular structure in kernel, it is not obvious where it is in this dump. And uh, an alternative approach is to blindly follow all the pointers. So we basically start somewhere in the kernel memory, we dump, for instance, a structure, look for everything that seems to be a pointer, we can validate them, whether they are correct, and then recursively follow everything we can find. Well, it's not always, in this approach, it's not always obvious what's the size of target memory. Also, it's not always uh, easy to determine which pointers matters to us. For instance, if we start dumping structure file, we will then follow to the structure task struct. We then, by using list head, follow all the task struct in the kernel, and the task struct also holds the pointers to virtual address spaces of the processes. So we will end up dumping virtual address spaces of almost every processes in the system. So again, we have no fine-grained access. 
in case of kflat, we can perform memory dump of only structure and its parts that are interesting for us. Our flattened image is very quick and easy to restore. And also we can intercept kernel functions invocations. So we can perform memory dump from the perspective of some function. And finally, our memory images directly represents kernel variables. So the very same code that use it uh, in the kernel can then use it in other application without any changes. So to sum up this part, Kflat is built as loadable kernel module. So it is very easy to use on embedded systems and can be easily loaded into running system. It provides instantaneous restoration, which is perfect for fuzzing and other use cases. And also it allows us to relate the memory dump with original structure of the code. So we don't have to use any additional API. We can just treat this restored memory like any other C memory. And now I would like to hand over to Bartosz, who will talk about use cases of Kflat and the automatic generation of the recipe of Kflat recipe that are necessary to perform these memory dumps. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so how could we use to test the Linux kernel, right? So actually, we ask ourselves the opposite question. What kind of tools could we uh, implement or integrate that could help us finding software problems in the Linux kernel? And one of the answers was the auto of target project. So let me quickly introduce uh, you to the auto of target project. So imagine you have to test a piece of software that is otherwise uh, very difficult to test. So you might have some uh, WLAN driver. You might have some parser embedded deeply in the, into your WLAN driver. And in order to test it, you have to uh, set up the connection and send the messages over the air. So you have natural limitation in the throughput. And so if you uh, employ some fuzzing, it would, it would be very slow. So you're looking for some alternatives. And one of them could be off-target testing. So what is this? So we just extract the parser code from your WLAN driver and test it, I mean, compile it on your uh, development machine and then just uh, create the executable and just feed the messages uh, to the, your parser code through this executable. So in that scenario, you have the, all the development tools available for your disposal. So you could use the GDB, you could embed coverage information, you could use Fuzzer, Sanitizers, Valgrind, you could even uh, use uh, symbolic execution, etc. Uh, of course, we assume that the parser uh, doesn't depend on the hardware very much, so it, it doesn't write to the CPU registers directly, just uh, a portable C code that shuffles around data between buffers. Uh, uh, yeah, so how to create the off-target? So you extract the main parser function and try to compile it, right? And probably it will fail because there are missing dependencies. So what you do is you just pull more code and some missing uh, type structures, some missing uh, type definitions, some missing functions, missing global variables, et cetera, and try to compile it again. And you probably have to do it many, many times until uh, it finally compiles. So as you can see, it's a quite painstaking job to do this. So that's why the AOT project was born, to solve this problem. You can see there's an automatic in the name, so it actually uh, extracts the compilable of target from some bigger system in an automatic fashion, so you can see if you're interested, you can see the GitHub page of this uh, tool, or you can read the paper or see the talk from the CLI workshop last year. But the main question is, how could this help us uh, in finding software problems in the Linux kernel, right? So uh, the main idea is, so maybe we could uh, take the entry point to the kernel, so for example, some IOCTL function, or uh, write, emmap, et cetera, and just create a target from it, compile it on your development machine, and just test it there. Yeah, but there's a problem because uh, when the kernel runs the IOCTL function, there is an entire kernel state available to it in, in this function. But when you just run it in your off-target, there isn't, right? Uh, so, yeah, so, you right, off-targets. Oh. So, of course, the IoT project uh, provides some initialization mechanism. So, uh, there is some feature that uh, it tries to uh, initialize all the uh, kernel structures in the off-target using some lightweight static analysis, but it's not perfect and fuzzing can lead uh, to some uh, false positives. So another idea is to, how about when the kernel runs the IOCTL function, so we just save the entire kernel state used by this IOCTL using the kflat uh, tool and just dump it to the file and restore it in the off-target. So you could imagine this whole process as just transferring the execution from the target to the host or development machine or multiple instances of the development machine at the point of this uh, IOCTL function. 
Okay, so the question is, so what is the kernel state used in this IOTTL function? So we have the uh, uh, we have the function arguments, like struct file here. It represents a, a lot of kernel state because it's quite a big structure. And we also have the global variables used in the code of our IOTTL function. So those are the two things that we need to save. And how to do it? I would just insert the caper injection at the entry of this IOTL function, and we can just run, execute the kflat recipes that do all this work. So if you need to extract the address of the global variables, we just can console the key or sims uh, kernel uh, yeah, symbol table. So initializing the part of the kernel state in the off target was one of the uh, possible usages of kflat productively. And another idea would be some uh, extracting some debug information from the running system or uh, getting some periodic snapshots of data for the tracing purposes. So here is an example of a simple recipe that is used to dump the task struct information from all the processes in the system. Actually, this is the full recipe that is needed to do this. And it follows the tasks dependency in the task struct struct. And yes, there's still a lot of uh, uh, non-pointer members in the task struct that can provide you with some uh, information. And below is an example of the a user space application that actually uh, reads the dump and just prints some information from this dump. But it, it can do uh, whatever it needs with that. So these were some examples how Kflat could be used uh, to actually uh, help finding and analyzing software problems in the Linux kernel. I, I hope and I'm, I'm sure uh, some of you can find either better ways of utilizing that. And right now I want to discuss uh, preparation of the recipes for the proper Kflat operation uh, for the Linux kernel structures. Yeah, so what's the deal here? Uh, so the Kflat dump is as good as the recipes used to describe the, describe the format of the data uh, to be saved. So we have a problem here because there's a quite a lot of kernel structures, right, that we would need to handle. So for example, in the Android common kernel for the x86, there's around 15,000 interesting uh, struct types that we, we would need to uh, handle. And what I mean by interesting is that some uh, non-anonymous or type depth struct types used in some functions or uh, some global variables. So, and even though half, half of it is trivial, meaning uh, there is no pointer data inside those structures, we still need to handle around 23,000 uh, pointer members and write the recipes for them. So the question is, maybe you could generate those recipes, right? And the problem is, uh, it's a very difficult problem to solve in general because you might encounter some uh, uh, edge cases that would require you to know the code perfectly well in order to write the proper recipe. So this is quite difficult to, to automate. So maybe you could take another approach, like uh, maybe you can generate all the recipes as which work most of the times and just to handle the edge cases uh, by hand, right? So now we are thinking about the writing the recipe generator. So, but in order for that, for this task to be successful, we would need to have some uh, kernel type information available to you because you just want to write the application, you don't want to write the parser itself. But actually uh, we have it because last year I spoke at the Linux Security Summit in North America about the code our services project and especially the function type database part of it, the FTDB. So you can see the YouTube video here if you're interested, but the main uh, point here is that we have this Clang processor that extracts some interesting information from the uh, C source code, like type information, and saves it in some intermediate format easily accessible uh, by application like in, in a JSON file. So now we have this JSON file, so we can just start writing application, our recipe generator. So let me show you what kind of problems you could encounter while trying uh, to do this. So the first problem is that, as I mentioned already, we have a lot of uh, structure members that we need to handle. So we have a lot of potential for the edge cases we might encounter, right? So, uh, yeah, so what's, so we can manage that by just focusing only on the members that we are interested in. So for example, in our off-target, that would be the members which are used in the off-target code. So for example, here we have this FBI still function and only the FI node member of the struct file of the argument file is actually used. So maybe you can get away with just writing the recipes only for this, uh, recipe only for this uh, member, right? 
And the data that back up this approach is something like uh, in our uh, experiments with generating uh, 1,000 of targets from, for the Linux kernel entry points. And when we focus only on the used members, uh, on average, there's around only 10% of the members actually used of all the defined members in the source code of the average of target. Yes, so another set of problems uh, is related to the polymorphic nature of the structure member. So for example, we have this void pointer member here. So where does this actually point to, right? Is it a strike B or maybe some array of integers, etc.? So we don't know that. So what we can do is we just uh, implement some kind of static analysis of the code and we just look for, in, for all the expressions where this void pointer member was actually uh, used. Maybe we can deduce the type it points to are based on this analysis. So it might be some, we can analyze the assignment expressions, uh, some initialization, uh, direct casts, passing to function, retrofer function, etc. So yeah, of course this un static analysis can give you some uh, uh, ambiguous results, and in that case, you would need to uh, intervene manually, but uh, in a lot of cases, it actually uh, gives you the one proper uh, type where it points to. Another problem, const, I mean, the character pointers. Is it pointing to a C string, like terminated by zero byte, or is it pointing to uh, some array of characters uh, of specified size, right? So what we can do, we can just take our member and check whether it was passed to some functions that we know takes the C string as an argument, like strlen here. If it does, so we can assume, we can deduce that our member is the actual C string because otherwise our original kernel code uh, would fail when executed. And here, the PK, is it pointing to a single element of the struct K or just to array of elements of struct K, right? What we can do, we can just check all the reference expressions of this, our member PK and check whether there's a the reference offset different than zero used in any of these expressions. If not, so we can assume that the deduce that PK is pointing to a single element of the potential array, right? And the final example, actually my favorite example is the, uh, the brilliant pattern of the Linux kernel list implementation. So what we got here is we have a list of the Linux kernel li elements linked together using the list head objects, right? So we have the uh, two challenges here. The first challenge is when we have list head member, is it a head of a list, right? Meaning pointing to the first and the last element of this list, but not being actually the list uh, element. Or we have the anchor, meaning it's embedded in some a bigger structure, and, and this structure is the actual list element. And the second challenge is we have to conclude what is the actual uh, list element type, right? Because we have only the anchor. So how to find the heads? So maybe you can just check all the invocations uh, of the Linux kernel list API and just to match the arguments passed to these functions with the uh, parameters that takes the head. So for example, here we have the LH2 member, which is passed to the list at tail as a second argument. So we can see in the API reference of the kernel, the second argument is a head. So we can conclude that LH2 is the actual head of the list and how to find out the, what is the actual type of the list element. So again, we look for some function in the list kernel API that actually extract the element type from the anchor. So for example, here there's the list for, list for each entry macro, which calls the container of under the hood. And this is actually what we're looking for because the second argument to the container of uh, is the actual uh, uh, list element type. So when we have the head and we have the list element type, we can just walk the entire list one by one and just dump it uh, to the, by using the, the recipes. Okay, so, so, the, so in summary, uh, we can apply some static analysis uh, to improve the generation of the recipes uh, for the Linux kernel structures. And one more thing I want to tell you about the recipes is the potential problems that you, you may encounter while trying to compile those recipes. Because as you can see, here is the reminder of the recipes from the beginning of this simple example from the beginning of this presentation. And as you can see here, the recipes uh, actually references the members by name. So in that case, you would need to include the full type definition of the structure in order to compile because the compiler needs to compute all the offsets. So it might be a problem when you're writing a recipe for a structure which is defined privately in some C file, right? 
because you cannot easily uh, include the C file in your code. So what Kplot, how Kplot helps you with that? It provides you with a family of some called self-contained family of recipes where it is your job to provide the, all the uh, offsets of the members in your structure and also the size uh, of this structure. So in that case, you don't need to include the type definition of the structure you're writing recipes for, but of course, uh, the minus side is that you need to compute all the offset by hand. But this is mainly dedicated for the recipe generator, so probably it wouldn't matter, uh, wouldn't matter to you. And the, finally, even if you have this very well-working recipe generator backed up with some advanced static analysis, there still might be cases where it won't work properly, like here. Are we using the void pointer member here? So we have to follow the dependency, or we're just using the assign long value and we just enough to copy the data, right? The, the information which member of this union is uh, currently used uh, can be uh, spread around different structures and might not be easy uh, to compute. So these kinds uh, of edge cases of problems would probably require some insight and help by some people who are responsible uh, for the specific module here. And also, even if you write a recipe for your own type, your own structure, in your own driver, you still can end up having uh, some common kernel structures in the dependencies. So you could end up writing the recipes for a common kernel structures uh, again and again. So what would be highly beneficial here is, is to if we have some this kind of library of KFLAD recipes written or reviewed by uh, experts for common kernel structures, which could we just include and just use in our code when we're writing recipes for our structures. And we're almost there. Everything we said about this so far about the serialization of the variables was done inside the kernel, right? But the same principles, the same algorithm could be applied to the user space memory as well, right? So we could easily extend kflat uh, to serialize the variables from the user space process. So for example, you might have some user space process which actually uh, reads or computes a lot of data before it actually start doing something useful. Like a very good example of that is some very big build system which reads a lot of make parses, reads and parses a lot of make files, make files be before actually it gives you some very small incremental build. So what could we do here is just we could preserve, prepare the snapshot in the memory of the all the parse make files, save it to the file, right? And again, when we run the build again, and assuming the make files didn't change, we could just read those in a matter of milliseconds. So to summarize that, Kflat can serialize a Linux kernel variables with their dependencies. So it's built as a Lodebar kernel module, so it's easy to use. Uh, even on the embedded systems, and it can restore image very quickly. And yeah, it can relate the content of the dump with the corresponding source code structures. So it can be used as a state initialization for the Linux kernel code. So you have to write the recipes to make a proper dump, but you can generate those recipes. But you might encounter edge cases that you would need to uh, fix by hand. And it can be easily uh, extended to the user space. Yeah, and you are the one who can find a new ways of using it. So thank you very much for your attention. The feedback is highly appreciated. There is, uh, this is open source tool, so there's a GitHub repository you might check. So just file an issue or create peer or just write us email with any critique that you uh, find appropriate. And if you have any questions, you can try to answer them now or just you can you approach us at any point during this conference. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and yeah, see you next time. So thanks, that was very interesting. Uh, uh, what I, uh, as, as a, you know, distro guy, I sometimes end up uh, debugging a crash dump of a uh, customer's 
uh, crashed kernel and the, there is the k-dump file infrastructure that uh, creates the full dump uh, because when you're crashed already you can just take the full dump but uh, so I, I wouldn't like uh, apply your complete uh, the, your complete but what, what, what was very interesting to me is the way you can classify lots of the pointers automatically because often when I had a crash jump there's some some address that's how someone involved in the issue and in the crash tool I can see so what is this address and it will tell me oh this comes from this slab cache so I know it's it's a dent tree and that's fine but uh, many of the allocations are from the KMLOC caches, which can be an, anybody uh, doing that, and uh, it, I don't know the type, and I have to somehow try to search if that pointer is used, uh, uh, if it appears in some other structure, that from that I can derive what it is. So. What, what you presented, the, the way how you automatically, you know, get this type information, I think it could be applied also to classify many of these KMLOC objects in, in a full crash dump. So that, so that would be very interesting to try. I tried it once as a quick project, but I quickly ran into the issue that I would have to do a lot of manual work and I don't have many of the type informations and now you told me that there's this ceiling based thing that can infer it by static analysis so that looks very useful thanks yes thank you uh, that was one our one of our main goal to deduce the types of the pointers uh, since we are performing this partial dump so we have to you know dump all of uh, the structures yeah so we have to know what the pointers are so uh, we are grateful that <laughs> you find this interesting and thank you. And maybe another question is how would you compare your approach with what Dragon is doing? Uh, Dragon. DRGN. The, 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 it's all something like a debugger for the kernel. Yeah, actually. Uh Currently, I mean, I'm not familiar with Dragon, so I, I cannot uh, compare it right now. Okay, maybe if you looked at it, it would also give some ideas how to improve your thing, because it also tries to look at the kernel without stopping it, and it uses the proc k-core mechanism, so it doesn't have to be a kernel module. and. Uh, you can write Python uh, scripts that tell it what to do, like the, the, the kernel specific knowledge you encode in the Python script, so you can tell it also, oh, look at this struct, uh, look at that struct. So, so you can kind of, uh, if your goal is to analyze some specific thing, you don't have to extract all the data outside, you can do it right using the Python script. But I, I don't think it can hook into the K-probe uh, entry points like your approach can do so. Yeah. yeah but you can look at it whether there's yeah, something. Thank you for your suggestion. I definitely we check this out. Yeah, here the first row. So, um, <clears throat> In my previous life, just working for a virtualization uh, company, um, we'd get crash dumps, I guess, similar to yours, um, of different types of Linux distributions, and we'd try to figure out if this was the virtualization tool, was the hardware, or it was the um, the kernel itself. And that would put us in a tricky spot for certain um, certain structures in, in, in the kernel. So I'm interested. Um, quite a lot in your mechanism of resolving the pointers again that's a very useful thing um, and not so much the actual serialization and rewriting it elsewhere although you know maybe the whole, the tool is together and maybe we can just use the uh, the pointer resolution part of it 
um, would it be possible to take the um, basically the pointer resolution components and turn it into something like a, either a standalone tool that look, look, uh, reads memory regions like uh, you know symbols or just memory regions and gives us a, a separate list to use like the symbol list or even a plugin into a GDB? Uh, yeah, sure. Our the static analysis tool is a already quite a separate uh, tool. It produces some an intermediate uh, representation of the structure, so it should be possible to like apply it into GDB so that you can follow the pointers in it, like uh, resolve in GDB what this pointer is, yes, and to what is, for instance, some void pointer pointing to in this current context. But uh, the very important part is that most of this applies to some very specific context of the kernel. So basically, we perform the static analysis from some function for some function, and we know that these void pointers point to something in this particular context. For instance, if you've got field private data in structure file, depending on the driver, it will point to something else. So in case of your core dump, you have to somehow know where the structure was. Yes, in what driver, so you can provide to our tool uh, where it should start looking from in this static analysis. But apart from that, yes, it should be uh, possible to apply in such scenario. Yeah, and the, the actual uh, RESF generator and the static analyzer, which is a part of the RESF generator, is actual a Python script as well. So it just uh, takes the information from this FTDB database. It's just a JSON file, generally, and just reads this information and tries to make this analysis based on that. So it just... A, you might call it a simple Python application, which just reads JSON and tries to uh, conclude some information from this representation of the source code in this JSON. So, yeah, it's, it can be easily uh, used in some other context too. So, I my question is more related to do with uh, test to code coverage testing. When your your job is to make sure that all your test cases cover code, but um, like something like GCOV, can't it's it's hard to use that to tell uh, am I covering lines of code in GCOV itself because that's running on the system. So, uh, is there any way? Not quite sure how to phrase the question, but is there any way you could use something like this to sort of subtract out what you don't want? and then show coverage of what's, what remains? So you would like to dump partial memory? Yes, and yeah, sure, we can perform some partial memory serialization or create uh, partial recipes. And I believe you can fit it into this GCOV if it is in the same format. But yeah, in general, KFLAT is fine-grained tool, so it can operate on the pointers that you instruct it to follow. So we can skip some pointers that you're not interested in in it. So the actual types is telling the engine, for example, if you have five pointers in the structure, so the type is telling, uh, okay, this point, this pointer points to struct B, so just, you, you know, this is struct B, so dump this as a struct B, right? So you can choose which of the members, pointer members, you, you, you just pick up. So you can just pick one of them or you, you just don't pick anything. So in the memory dump, you will have the original pointer's values, right? Or, but if you just pick this, uh, you write, pick this member, right, recipes for it, so then it, follow, it follows this dependency and in the dump it produces, you will have, in, on the other hand, when you restore the image, that you will have the uh, proper uh, pointer in the user space. So you can just pick any member that you want, or you can just don't pick any, so it, then it will not follow them. Uh, thank you for the talk. Contains a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, I have a, uh, some practical question. Uh, do you know maybe like do you have maybe some examples uh, how uh, KFLAT helped to solve your, uh, some issues or find some bugs uh, in, in like in real life? So actually, the main idea is that we presented. It's 
something like initialization, initialization of the kernel state inside the off target. So the main idea is to just, just take the entry point to the kernel and generate off target for it. And we just want to test it on your development machine. So we don't want you know, to uh, make run fuzzing on the target. We just want to run fuzzing of this function extracted from uh, this target like mobile device and just com compiled on your development machine, a big server, the host machine, big server, and just make fuzzing there. And yeah, and as I mentioned, there's a problem with the initialization of the state which this off-target code uses because original kernel code have the entire full kernel state available, but in the off-target there isn't. So you have to somehow initialize uh, those structures in the off-target. So this is actually the main usage that we currently are using for the initializing this off-target code from the Linux, extracted from the Linux. Yeah, so this is, okay, we, so we don't have any other examples apart from extracting some debug information from the kernel as well, which can be easy, but more usages are up to, to you know, just finding out uh, another usage of this tool, right? Uh, okay, thank you. Now we have better understanding of like, uh, how it's used. Thank you, Mish. I think it's a pretty, and it could be very useful to debug the kernel code. Uh, but you also mentioned that in your talk it could be used also for in the user space. Then um, I thought about that and I realized this solution could could only work for like a C uh, language because um, when you calculate the oversight or switch back to the to owner, uh, it's it, if it there if it there any additional information like. Uh, like Java, there is some metadata about the object. It won't, will it work? Yeah, you are exactly right. This uh, works only for the C code. Yes. Okay. Because, yeah. Because we have to uh, write the recipes for the C kernel structures. And this engine uh, supports uh, only the, the C code structures. Currently, some, some POD, plane of data structures. So we don't support the C++, uh, at least so far. Yeah, but I don't think it would. Uh, Go, go farther than the C and potentially C++. So yes, uh, it's uh, only for the you know for C structures from the C code. Yeah. Do do you know? I don't know Rust because I know the kernel is start with using Rust. In do you think or because I don't know Rust, do you think this also work for Rust? We don't know Rust either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any more questions, we will be somewhere around this conference. Yeah, thank you.